And uh, because I work for Oracle, I have to mention that I won't really be talking about any future products, but if we do venture in that area, take whatever I say about something that doesn't have a price or stock keeping unit with a grain of salt. I might be thinking, I might be saying the word blue, you're thinking sky blue, I'm thinking ocean blue, and ends up being blue cheese. And I'm also mainly talking today about the community edition. If I talk about something in the enterprise edition, um, I'll make sure I note it. By the way, enterprise edition is where you get a support phone number, you get a couple extra plugins, you get a better backup tool, you get a great monitoring tool. Um, you also get some other stuff, uh, connection pooling, all that, uh, at rest encryption for your data, and some other tools. So, MySQL is now 23 years old. Oracle's owned us for nine, almost 10 years. Uh, MySQL 8.0 is the currently general, generally available release. 8.0.16 came out on Thursday. Uh, big change, changes there are that now the check constraints thing on your table definitions work. And also, you don't have to run MySQL upgrade anymore after you upgrade the software. The software is now smart enough to realize that something's changed and will go through and modify the system tables for you. Also, in 8.0, our uh, big things we, we really stepped out with are the document store, I'll mention that a little bit later, and group replication. By the way, we're hiring. Most of us, 85% of us, work from home. So if you're looking for a job where your commuters get out of bed, step over the dog, and turn left, uh, let me know. So when I started about MySQL 8, the first questions I get is, well, we were running 5.7. What happened to MySQL 6? What happened to MySQL 7? Well, before the Sun acquisition, there was a MySQL 6, much like there was a PHP 6. And it never quite came to fruition. And in both cases, the good features were backported into the 5.x platforms. And the 7 series has been used by our clustering product. Um, if you, don't, you may not know that you're using the clustering product, but if you have one of these and you're traveling around, as you go between cell tower and cell tower, you're being tracked with MySQL MDB cluster. That's a in-memory, high-speed, uh, uh, low-latency database. It's designed to be extremely redundant. It will geo-replicate between data centers for you. And it's very good if you're running a cell phone company, an aircraft carrier, or playing a massively parallel online game. Well, that's the stuff I just talked about. So the big change in MySQL 8, functionality-wise, was the new data dictionary. In the past, if you got under var lib MySQL and then an ls minus lar, you saw dot myis, dot frms, dot da 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 da, and uh, besides chewing up inodes, that was your metadata. And 25 years ago, that was a acceptable way of doing that. Unfortunately, it was acceptable to a lot of problems, most notably junior admins coming through and, oh, that doesn't look like a useful file, I'll just delete it. Um, and goodbye database. Uh, the other thing is that we learned from replication that you can actually keep a lot of the information in the database. Big exciting concept there. And once you start doing that, you get a lot of very interesting things. Now, I want to let you know that even the system tables, which in the past were stuck at MyISAM, were, were, weren't transactional, but now they are. And they're all inside the database. So the good news with all this is that you now have millions of tables within a schema. By the way, in the MySQL world, we kind of confound the term schema and database. The bad news is you now have millions of tables within a schema. Uh, the record I've seen so far is about 31 and a half million tables before they just got bored. So you're now living large. By the way, that's me leaning, pretending to lean up against Simon Cowell's car uh, a year and a half ago in Pasadena. What you can't see right past the right fender of the thing is his security guards laughing. And if I went a little bit further, they wouldn't be laughing, they'd be tackling me. Also, we added common table expressions and windowing functions. This turns your SQL from a fairly benign descriptive language into an imperative language. It gives you a lot more power over what you're doing. CTEs are handy in that if you've ever had trouble writing subqueries, especially uncorrelated subqueries, um, you no longer have to worry about that anymore. And windowing functions are great because you can now break up your data for analytics. In the past, with standard SQL, you can either do analytics on everything in a column or just one column or one row at a time. I know you could group things together, but it was kind of messy. 
didn't quite give you all the stuff you wanted. Now for ordering functions, the key word you want to watch out for is over. What you're doing is you're iterating over a partition. In this case, we're par going by the partition of de department ID. And we're going to go through as the company's employee records and give the, the department salary and the sum of the salary for each department. Now something else you can do is if you have a boss who comes up and says, hey, how is our sales to, to date? I want to know from last Tuesday to today what we've been selling or what our income is or uh, how much we've been shipping. You can define that window, uh, what you're doing the overbuy for time, dates, numerics, whatever else you can do. So it gives you a lot more flexibility over uh, how you do stuff. By the way, we can also do quartiles, percentiles, all that other stuff, uh, lag, lead, moving averages and all that. Common table expressions. Uh, what you do is, it's much like a view, you define a query. And we're going to call this, in this example, we're going to call the query QN. And QN is defined as select uh, T1 from a table called my table. And then you use that, that QN query, the CTE, to query off that. So it's sort of like a view, but it has a lot more features uh, down the line. The most interesting one is that you can define multiple CTEs and join them. Now, I don't know how many of you like writing subqueries. To me, they're kind of like writing regular expressions. They're painful, and you come back a week later, and if you can understand it, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> also, CTEs can be recursive. So if you work in a job where you really have to do the Fibonacci sequence on a daily basis, this is your code. Also, we added support for lateral derived tables. In the past, I'd write a subquery that I thought was really good. This optimizer would kick it back saying, uh-uh, you're, you're trying to reference something that hasn't been defined yet. So what lateral queries do, and the lateral query here is, is in red, is it lets you define a subquery and then have it referenced from the outside query. In the past, the optimizer would see the, the query that we now have defined in red and wouldn't know how to dig in there to get that information. Now we have lateral derived tables, so you can actually go out and do that. Lots of changes in the optimizer and the parser. Uh, the first one that I have to apologize for is we now have true descending indexes. In the past, you would define an index as descending, and we just read it backwards. We didn't really create a descending index. Um, we also give you a lot more information at the lower level, so if you want to play uh, with information schema, and system, uh, schema uh, there's a lot more stuff there. And we also have ways to have optimizer hints that I'll show later. Also, the, some interesting changes in locking. And you can also do now an explain format equals JSON. So you can get all the information in a JSON format. So if you want to feed that to another program for analytics, you can. Locking. Pretend you're your ticket master and um, you want to sell tickets and your customer says, OK, I want something in, in, in rows two and three. So you do your query, and before we had skip block, what would happen is your query would go out to the server, but some other query would be out there blocking those rows. So what you can do now is, if those rows are being blocked by someone else, it will skip all those rock, lock, locked records and get the available records. So if someone's out there and they're looking at seats number 15 and 16, you might get seats 17 and 18. Very interesting. Another option you can do is add no wait. So rather than waiting for the lock to get undone, if everything's locked up, it immediately returns to your application or your query and says, I couldn't get anything in rows two and three, which I try rows three and four. By the way, if you uh, go out to Google and you type <coughs> in the smuggest looking cat, this is the picture you get. The University of Michigan has some researchers who wrote a paper almost two years ago now called Contention Aware Transaction Scheduling. Um, our engineers looked at this and instantly loved the paper, implemented all of their recommendations, and found out it didn't work. Well, there's some stuff in the paper they didn't quite fully explain. There's some stuff that we assumed that they didn't assume. But after a little bit of work coming back and forth, they were able to get this CAT scheduler working. Uh, to distill it to its shortest uh, point, if you have hot rows or hot columns in tables, the easiest and fastest way they've proven to get that 
contention out of the way is give it to the greediest query first. You get the, gr greedy, gre the greediest query satisfied, it goes on its way, next greediest query gets fulfilled, away it goes. They've proven mathematically that that's the fastest way to get highly contentious uh, situations going. So if you have really, really, really uh, a lot of contention on just a few rows or columns, this will really speed you up. Yes, sir? What, what makes a query more greedy than another one? It's grabbing more resources. Okay, so it's, it's just going through more rows? Yeah. Okay. So the more gluttonous it is for data, the, the more likely it is to be satisfied and go away if you give it what it wants. I guess that's my question. Is it, is it greedy if it returns more rows or if it evaluates more rows? I don't think the optimizer at that point makes a makes a decision as, as, you know, what are they grabbing, what are they trying to get, get access to? Okay. Because I think the returning step is uh, down the, the stack before it actually pops it off and sends it down the, the pipeline. So, I think. What, what if you had a situation where you, like it might be unlikely, but where you disagreed with the optimizer on this and you wanted to do something different? Well, we have optimizer hints. By the way, I have not met, worked with this man before. Uh, I'll get to optimizer hints in just a second. Uh, something else we did, we, uh, we follow the SQL standard and implemented rules. Uh, if you've worked for a small company uh, in March, February, you start adding more accountants because you have tax season coming up in April. And what you do is you find out, okay, who's the senior accountant? We'll copy their, their stuff for the new accounting clerks coming in. And the senior clerk might have more privileges than you want the junior clerk having, especially you find that out when the junior clerk deletes something that you don't want them to delete. So. If you have things where you have generalized roles, accounting clerk, uh, loading dock technician, um, someone who ships something from the warehouse, you can define these roles. And as people roll in and out of the jobs, you can assign those roles. And you can't assign multiple roles to a person. So if you have someone who uh, is going to be temporary, you don't have to worry going out and trying to scramble. What do they really need access to? You say, OK, we've decided that this role has this privileges for this job. And uh, you can. Uh, you can trim the role as need, need be rather than going after individual accounts. Other big change. Uh, in the past, when I started with MySQL 20 some odd years ago, I used to set my servers to speak only Latin 1. Why? Lived in the middle of, Cal of uh, Texas. Everything was English. Didn't have to worry about umlauts, sedils. And uh, that has changed in the past 20 some odd years. So by default, MySQL 8 is UTF-8 MB4. UTF MB4. This is all of the Unicode 900 character set. And by default, we have the accent insensitive and the case insensitive version um, hooked up as by default. Now, previously, our UTF-8 MB, MB4 was actually three bytes, which means you didn't get emojis. And um, didn't really have all four character planes out there. Uh, we didn't have any of the uh, CJK defined ideographs, so if you're doing Chinese, Japanese, or Korean, you're in trouble. And I want to warn you, this might be the only place where you might have upgrade problems from 5.7 to 8.0. By the way, if you're running our new shell, there's a command you can type util, check for upgrade, and give the address of your server. It will actually go through and list out anything that you may need to upgrade or change before going to 8.0. Mm -hmm. By the way, as far as I know, we're the only database that supports the GB 18 or 30 character set, so if you're doing Mandarin, uh, you need to look into that. So why are we doing all this? <laughs> because someone in your corporation wants this in your data set. A couple months ago, I was talking to a company. They're trying to do three-part three part authentication to log in. They want a username. They want an authentication string. And they want you to input an emoji. What could go wrong with that? Invisible indexes. Uh, in the past, if you're running explain on a query, uh, if you had an index you weren't quite sure had any value, what you do is you blow it away. Rerun your explain and say, oh, yes, I need that in there. Recreate that, that index. Uh, meanwhile, your coworkers who heavily depended on that index were, were uh, knocking on your door, asking you, what the hell do you think you're doing? <laughs> so with Invisible Index, what, what it does is it temporarily makes the index well, invisible to the optimizer. So if you run explain after turning it into visible and you find out you need it there, you can turn it back to visible. Now if you have an index you think that you want to get rid of, but you're not quite sure 
Uh, make it invisible for a little bit. See if anyone complains. Also, we now have support for functional indexes. Now, in the past, indexes were kind of limited where you couldn't use functions. Um, and it uh, was somewhat problematic. So if you're trying to do something like you're trying to break up your, uh, so like column one is a price range where someone's looking for something between 10 and $20, uh, 20 and $30 and all that, you can now have an index on that. Uh, you can also do an index in multiple columns on some sort of calculation. Set persist is very handy if you're working in a shop where multiple people are admitting the system. I make a change today, she makes a change tomorrow, he makes a change on Thursday, Friday for some reason, um, things go down and everything reboots and the three changes we made have not been recorded, they have not been notated, they're not out there on the Slack channel. So the system comes back and it's running horribly. Well, set persist, you uh, just put persist before you change the, uh, the setting. And what happens is that information gets off, written off to a file called mysqld.auto.cnf, which is the last thing run as the system reboots. So if you're working in an environment with multiple admins, or you're working in a containerized environment, or you're working in the cloud, this is a handy way to make sure that you save your changes. By the way, uh, when changes are made, it is timestamped with the username and recorded in your logs, so you can find out who's doing what and to whom. Uh, one of the things we're doing is we're releasing four times a year now, if not more. Uh, we have a lot of new features that are coming out and we didn't want to have them tied to the dot release cycle. So you didn't have to wait like you did when you went from 5.5 to 5.6 to get certain features. By the way, these all implemented as shared objects that you, what we call plugins that you can either turn on or turn off as you, as you need. Big change for us is our GIS support. Uh, this is one of the smarter things that Governor Schwarzenegger said, which is not a, uh, a, a, a long list of uh, smart things he said. Now, in the past, I used to tell people on post-GIS if they really depended on any sort of graphical information system stuff. But with 5.7, we moved our libraries from something we wrote to the boost.geometry folks. Uh, the Boost folks are writing a lot of C++-based libraries that are very, very well respected, they're peer-reviewed, and they're very, very rugged. So in 5.7, we went, took their 2D models. In 8.0, we went to 3D. So we have the option now to be a flat world, or, well, you've, you've heard the joke that the uh, Flat Earth Society has members around the globe. <laughs> or you can do the full uh, wraparound ellipsoidal world, so you can do all the 3D stuff. So if you want to write your own Google Maps, you can do that. Now, JSON has probably been the biggest change in MySQL in the last two releases. Um, why? Because it's very handy and there's a lot of data that uh, when you start programming something, you don't know what it's going to look like uh, as you roll out. As I go around, I'm running into more and more developers that told to start coding, we'll tell you what your data will look like later. Which is a little scary. Uh, one big benefit to this is that if you're doing a lot of dives into smaller and smaller and smaller tables to get uh, data, you can probably use a JSON column in a higher table in that stack order and reduce a lot of many and many joins. Also let you plan for mutability. In the past, if you had a change to your data, you had to go out and get the DBA to go out there and add another column, possibly another index, maybe a primary key, it gets messy. Uh, DBA is overloaded in work and gets grumpy and doesn't do that. With a JSON column out there, it's just another key value that you insert. Away you go. So I mentioned it's a good way to remove many to many relationships. And something else we did, uh, when we originally started with the, with the JSON data type, to get a piece of information, you use the JSON extract function, name the JSON column you're going to do, and specify well, dollar cents for the entire document and what the key is that you want the value from. But that came out quoted. So to get it unquoted, you'd have to wrap JSON unquote around JSON extract. And our guys got tired of typing JSON extract by itself, so they came up with the single-headed arrow operator. Well, I think the same engineer got tired and said, well, rather typing this and then that, we'll just have two arrows. Now, if you find a good use for a third arrowhead, let me know. Our engineers would love to hear it. 
Also, JSON is sold as being um, easy to read for humans, which compared to XML or SGML or anything else in front of that, I agree. The only trouble is it tends to come out in your database as one long string of stuff that wraps. And if you're over 25, um, at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're looking at that, and you're just going, this is, this is too messy. So thankfully, we got a JSON pretty function to go out there, and it breaks up the embedments within the data. Also, we have uh, two functions for aggregating arrays. Uh, as you can see here, we have two JSON objects. You can tell they're objects because they have curly braces instead of square braces or square brackets around them. So we have two JSON objects that we're going to run through this JSON aggr array ag function. And suddenly we have one JSON format array. And we have the corresponding thing where you can take information that are in objects and turn out to objects. By the way, this also works with non-JSON data. So if you have a bunch of data you need to turn from standard relational stuff into a JSON object very quickly, you can do that too. Uh, if you remember my talk yesterday, you heard me expound on JSON table. The basic idea is that you have all this unstructured, no SQL JSON document stuff, but you want to process it temporarily as a relational table. What you do is you feed it through JSON table, and you say, okay, anything under the key value name, I'm going to cast as a car 20 and call it country name. And anything under the key value of independent year, I'm going to cast as an integer. And then I can use a where clause on it. Now here I'm doing something very simple, but it could be a windowing function, it could be other analytics, it could be group buys, it could be sorts, it could be whatever I want it to be. So once again, let you take temporarily your unsorted stuff, your unordered stuff, and turn it into a structured column or a structured table. This is a, a little more complex version where you actually have nested values. So if you have an array of nested things like restaurant arrays, you can do that. It will also give you ordinal numbers for free. And it makes it very easy to handle a lot of embedded JSON data. Now, on top of the JSON document, uh, JSON column, we started working with a document store. Uh, the idea is very much like Mongo. You don't need to be able to have a DBA help you start your programming project. You attach the server, depend, define what schema you want to talk to, and from there you create a collection and away you go. Um, once again, you don't need a DBA to set up all this other stuff. And the other thing is all your queries do not need SQL. You're going to write something that looks much more closer to what your programming language does. Now here's an example in PHP. On the top, you authenticate in. Notice the new protocol is on port 33060 for the document store versus our traditional 3306. So in this case, uh, we're going to start a session. We're going to talk to the schema named World X. In that schema, there is a collection named Country Info. And in there, we want to find all the records where the underscore ID field is equal to USA. From all those records, we only want the name key value pair. We're going to alias that as country. We're going to get the geography information. We're going to alias that as geo. And specifically, we're going to get the geo.region. And we're just going to call it geo.region. Go ahead and execute that and return the data. Big thing to notice there is there's no SQL in there. Also, if you have a junior developer and they need to put a sort in there, or they need to change the fields or change the alias, or they want to do a group by, um, they're not rewriting the entire query. They're just post pending another arrow field and putting it in there. Uh, we support Java, C, C++, PHP, Node, JavaScript, Python, .NET. I know they're working on Perl. I know they're working on Go. And there's another one I'm missing, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. If you're connecting with a library like PDO, is all of them, are all of those features available right away, or are you restricted from them? You have to use our XDev API Peckle extension. Uh, PDO, PDO is kind of a grab bag. Uh, no one really maintains the overall architecture of PDO. Our engineers take care of the MySQL stuff, unless it breaks the bigger structure. Uh, I don't know if PDO is eventually going to get there. They may. I'm hoping. 
Is there any interoperability between the document store and the traditional like Ino DB or SQL based yeah. DB or? Yeah, the uh, document store is all built on top of the new protocol that runs on top of InnoDB for convenience. And you could use the document store with relational tables okay. or the JSON documents or a combination thereof, or you can cast the NoSQL JSON document stuff as a relational table. Gotcha. Okay. So, if, if you're trying to do that, what port would you connect on? Would it matter? Uh, 33060, zero. the new protocol. I'll mention the new protocol in just a minute. Something else you can do is if you, everyone here is running on multi core boxes, there's one guy I was talking to yesterday who was telling me that you know, the, the single core boxes are, are a lot more convenient for him. What you can do is you can create a resource group and say, okay, I want CPUs two and three to be put into a group called batch, and they're going to have thread priority of 10. I think it runs to minus 20 to plus 20 for the for the values. And in your query, you put in a comment, resource group batch. So if you have something that's a low priority insert, the optimizer will see this and push it off to those two CPUs. Meanwhile, your other 62 uh, cores can go off and do whatever you need to do. Histograms, I mentioned this uh, in the talk yesterday. Histograms are interesting in that they don't um, need the overhead of indexes, but I'll let you roughly group your data so the optimizer knows where it is. It's like breaking up a room of uh, kids' first names, A to C over this corner, D to E over that corner, F to J over there, and everyone else over here. If you're looking for a kid named Ralph, you know he's going to be over in this corner, or you're looking for a Bob or Betty, they're going to be over in that corner. Uh, the optimizer works kind of like a uh, GPS system. It knows historically how to get to some place and the more hints you can give it, the better. But if you have a field that you really don't want to index just because it's, uh, uh, you don't want the overhead of indexes, histograms let you very easily tell the optimizer uh, how to narrow down the search for it. Very easy to create, uh, use the analyze table function, and you determine the number of buckets you want, maximum number is 1024. So depending on the or cardinality of your uh, data, uh, you might want fewer numbers than 1024. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, not doesn't have the overhead of, of uh, indexes where everything, every time you change something to an index table, you have to update it. Does, yeah? Does that put the same number of records in every bucket, or does it, does it, it does the buckets by, like? It evenly, well, what it does is you specify the number of buckets, and it, and it divides the number of data points by the, that number of buckets. Okay. So in some cases, you might have A to F in the first bucket if you're doing the name short. In another case, you might have uh, the first two letters AA to AJ if you have a lot of people who first yeah. names start with okay. over there. Uh, our old memory storage engine and our old temporary engine had problems. Um, we've rewritten those, um, much, much better performance. Matter of fact, right after we came out with 8.0, we had a gentleman on Stack Overflow who was complaining that things are running too fast. <laughs> um, very rare to have someone complain that the database is running too fast. And he wanted to know why. So one of our engineers said, well, uh, it used to be what would happen is you'd get to a certain size, 16 megabits in size on an operation, and if you needed more, everything would halt. All that would be copied over to InnoDB and then restarted. So the getting to that size, stopping, copying over, and then restarting with the new engine, uh, very expensive. So um, much, much, much faster. So if you're doing anything that, that uh, relies on temp tables, you'll find it uh, roughly 10% faster. 10% or 10x? Should be 10%. Uh, previous slide said 10x. 10 times, yeah. I'll have to go back and double check that. Um, well, at least 10 times, hopefully 10x. <laughs> so, uh, we wrote our, our API. So traditionally, you use a connector into your application that spoke SQL over our old protocol, port 3306, uh, spoke to our relational tables, new protocol, uh, you can also talk to that through a connector or a new shell. You need to use the CRUD API or the SQL API over our new protocol. 
Uh, new protocol is built on Google Protobus, so it's going to be a lot harder to do SQL injection and talk to either the JSON, no SQL collections, or the relational tables. So this gives you both SQL and no SQL. Uh, the payload in a JSON uh, document is roughly a gigabyte versus Mongo 16 megabytes. Uh, it's schemaless. Uh, it also has Elastic compliance, which uh, Mongo is just now getting into point, uh, having some trouble with it, with their consistency issues. Oops. Uh, here's something you can't do with Mongo. Um, this is Mongo's restaurant database. It has the health rating records for restaurants in the five boroughs of New York City. And if you want to go out and find the best restaurant with the highest health score, uh, by the way, if you're ever in New York City and you walk by a restaurant that has an A on the window outside, those are good to eat by B, it's a little risky, C, D, E, and F, you're really taking your, your arm <laughs> in your hand. Um, it's real funny, um, you can go to certain neighborhoods and you start noticing there's a lot of B's and C's and you keep walking until you find the A's and then you'll find them in that, that neighborhood. So what we're doing here is we're using a uh, JSON table to go out and go through the embedded array of scores and find the highest scores and then we're using a common table expression to go through and get the name of the cuisines from all that and type of the scores. And then we use a windowing function to figure out which cuisine uh, we, we want and give the highest score per cuisine. So as it comes through, we find out that the cuisine of juice, smoothies, and fruit salads, which I never knew was a proper cuisine. Uh, the highest score is 75, Chinese is 73, and it kind of gets kind of depressing if you're in Mexican food like I am. Uh, here's the uh, stuff highlighted a little bit better, easier to read. Uh, the JSON tables in purple, the CTEs in blue, and the winning functions in red. So, uh, ADO has been out for roughly a year, just over a year now. Uh, by the way, we do have Docker <coughs> images out there. And we also just started adding minimal images. So if you're running something like DB Deployer, we need the absolutely bare minimum to get running. Uh, we have that out there in uh, gzip files. Uh, because I only have roughly 40 minutes to talk, uh, I've skipped over a lot of stuff. So if you're looking for many, much more details on how this works, uh, changes like query rewrites, and uh, uh, I forget to mention the query hints to you. There's a thing that we can do now with query hints where you put a comment in your query and say, join table one to table two first to make life easier because I've found in the past that works and the optimizer will believe you. And we'll try to re-optimize that. So that was a real quick overview. Uh, I want to mention group replication. This is active, active, master, master. The idea is that if a master <coughs> goes bad, the other masters will notice that and stop communicating with it. And when one master that's actively, uh, that gets contacted by your application gets a write, it will tell all the other things, okay, we have a write, we're going to call it number 1542, everyone get ready to write 1542, and they all do that. Question, that's in community edition? In the community edition. Nice. Um, our basic model for, for most of you out there is that your application is going to speak to something like MySQL router, because your application really shouldn't care what's down here. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's one machine or 5,000 machines. The idea is your application just wants something to read and write to. That's going to be MySQL router or my favorite proxy SQL. Uh, here's a case where it's very simple where we have a primary that reads and writes and then secondaries that do read only like in traditional asynchronous replication. By the way, you can use our new shell to admin all that. Uh, here's what happens when a, a uh, server fails. Everything's working as primaries. Server 1 fails, so servers 2, th 3, 4, and 5 take over. You might have to retry a write or a read. Uh, hopefully not on a read, but you might. Definitely on a write. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a new shell that takes care of the new protocol. It has three modes, JavaScript, Python, and SQL. So if you're used to massaging your data with a script you can, and you're used to uh, Python or JavaScript, you can do that. One very interesting piece of uh, code they put in last fall 
is a bulk importer for JSON. Uh, before this, I was writing little scripts in Python to open up the file and uh, parse everything out. This bulk loader is much, much, much faster. Very soon it will have parallel imports, so it will be able to divvy up your JSON documents and import them much faster. I'm going to show you this in the, the booth if you come down there later. If you're playing with the JSON data type, uh, please buy my book. When the JSON data type first came out, I thought our documentation was pretty bad. It had some examples that uh, were taken from the work log and didn't really make a lot of sense unless you played with them for a long time to eliminate that. I wrote a very short book, 120 some odd pages, that has a lot of examples and code, code samples in various languages. Also tries to explain what's going on behind the scenes. And with that, uh, I got five minutes for questions. And if you need to get a hold of me, I'm at Stoker on Twitter. There's my email address. Uh, there's where the slides are, and there's where one of my blogs is. By the way, my dog hates this picture. She does not like the way she looks in my glasses. <laughs> By the way, it's the first dog I've ever seen that watched me open a doorknob and then tried to duplicate the action and then eventually got it. So I have to throw the bolts on doors when I try to lock her inside. So what questions do you have? The, uh, the new document engine, mm -hmm. um, how does replication work for that? Is it the same as? Same as this. You can do standard async, semi-sync, or group replication. We are quite group for a Sunday. <laughs> just not awake yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I noticed the coffee shop was open this morning, which I thought was a shame. Yeah. But uh, well, if that's it, uh, if you have any other questions, either contact me via those things or hit me in the booth. I'm almost out of swag downstairs. You have your book in the booth? Unfortunately, I don't. I uh, I got into trouble because my boss said, "Go out and order 100 copies of your book and give them out at shows." So I did that, and the accountants didn't like that. They thought I was making myself rich. And I basically make about 25 cents a book. <laughs> Have you ever tried arguing with an accountant from a foreign country that 25 cents a book is really not a great boon? And uh, unfortunately, it's the end of our fiscal year, and I need to reorder. But I have to wait until July 1st. <laughs> By the way, Amazon occasionally throws sales on it. So if you go out there and you want to Kindle edition, occasionally it's like $5. But I recommend the hardcover or the, so actually the paperback. I recommend that because you're going to be scribbling notes in there as things change. Other than that, thank you all for coming out. <laughs>